And uh, so being with her and connecting, reconnecting with that uh, helped me to really understand that uh, if you really truly do what you love, everything else in your life falls into place. And that's how it's worked out for me. Welcome to the Private Chef Podcast, serving the 1%. I'm your host, Hannes Henschi. And on our show, we speak to the best chefs, how they honed in on their skills to excel in the industry and what it takes to work as a private chef for some of the most exclusive clients in the world. Welcome back to the Private Chef Podcast. Today, we have Cindy Trejo. She works for the state of Nevada, cooking for the governor. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So, do they ever visit you in the kitchen? Or? <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, <laughs> they do. And we have... Uh, uh, so, my, in my culinary career, which is my second career, while I was in culinary school, I started noticing how energetically uh, things would feel different in the kitchen sometimes. And I would see shapes take place in my sauces and in some of my food and I started acknowledging it and it's carried throughout my culinary career every place I've worked and uh, this is no different and so uh, there is a um, there's two energies that we see sometimes um, in different forms and we've affectionately nicknamed one of them a woman that we believe is from the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, who approves and sometimes disapproves <laughs> of what we're doing and things get pushed around in the kitchen. We find out about oh. it. But we've, we've affectionately named her Que Linda, which in Spanish is cute, very cute. And um, the reason we name her that is because we felt her one day and I kept asking her to reveal her name and I was uh, I ran out of a particular ingredient and had to run to the store and I was standing at the checkout line holding the ingredient in my hand and I said really it'd be quite polite of you to introduce yourself and over the loudspeaker <laughs> The, someone said, Linda, come to the dairy department. Linda, we need you now. And I happened to be holding a lot of butter in my hand. So that's how <laughs> we, we came to nickname her. <laughs> so that, that, that's quite something. Tell us a little about the transition, because I actually find it quite fascinating. And we already spoke about it. But, you know, coming from your first career and then really kind of exploring what the kitchen means to you personally, which really is, is your true passion. Yeah, I was a corporate banker, a commercial banker and a corporate banker for a number of years. And so my job was to take people involved, taking people to lunch and dinner and very lovely restaurants and enjoying good food. And, um, My mom became ill, and I went to be with her, and she, um, while I was with her, she helped me remember uh, what my passions were as a kid, and I was always in the kitchen, and she gave me a collection of items that she'd been keeping for me, and there were even pictures of me as a toddler, <laughs> all dressed up, Uh, trying to cook in the kitchen. So we had lots of long conversations and that led to uh, her telling me not to live with any regrets in my life and um, her revealing some of her own. And it was just a very heartfelt spiritual time for me. And um, in the when I returned home, I explored culinary school and decided to uh, embark upon that journey. And it's been Uh, and it's been an extraordinary journey, but I think as, as a career, it became very clear to me when one day uh, in culinary school, I was standing at the stove next to the grill, 
and I was grilling bronzino and I was making a Moroccan sauce and my rice pilaf was coming together perfectly and I was watching the sauce uh, evolve and I saw the fish transform and I realized that I was not in a cubicle at a computer and that I was perfectly, perfectly happy and that was when I knew that this was for me. And as I sat down and ate my gorgeous bronzino with my beautiful Moroccan sauce, uh, I savored every bite. And uh, that's, that's when I'm cooking and something comes together that way, I know that everything is working and I'm in the right place at the right time doing the absolute right thing. So and that's so lovely. I remember the first time you shared this with me. You know, it's like you you can feel you can feel how how that was for you. For someone who is maybe trying to pursue their own passion, what what was that conversation like that you have with your mom that maybe gave you a hint? What what were you doing at that time in your life to to hone in on what you th thought was your passion, but then eventually truly confirmed to be your passion? Uh, well, I think uh, my mom was ill and she didn't have much time left. And so it became a moment where it was just a matter of weeks, actually, um, where we just got really real about what we loved and what we didn't love. And we shared so many memories of... <laughs> Things like peeling potatoes and uh, choosing uh, tomatoes from the garden and um, making her favorite dishes, which were very simple, potato salad and meatloaf and things that she, uh, she enjoyed and that my grandmother enjoyed and that uh, I had forgotten that I enjoyed. Um, It was uh, it was interesting for her to talk about things that she had never shared with me before. Some of her own regrets, and my my family had had always we had lived in a house in Southern California um, for all of my life, uh, and I had been in California up to that point my entire life, and they had sold. Uh, our home and property and moved to uh, the Midwest, to Oklahoma, when they had a pond on their property and they had a garden and they had deer and they just had so much. She counted the trees in the front yard. I remember 32 trees in the front yard. And she talked about uh, harvesting and preparing and enjoying. And uh, the few times that I spent with her, we we fished and uh, chose vegetables and we prepared our meals from everything that was there. And uh, so being with her and connecting, reconnecting with that uh, helped me to really understand that uh, if you really truly do what you love, everything else in your life falls into place. And that's how it's worked out for me. Nice. So back to that moment where you were transforming the Brancino and savoring every taste after having kind of realized that you found your passion, how did your career then pan out in the kitchen? Well, I was really fortunate. I, I'm, you know, a mature person and I was in class with a lot of, uh, uh, students who were very early in their career, just out of high school or just in their early 20s. And um, so it, it gave me an opportunity to just kind of get to it. I wasn't, uh, I, w I wasn't really distracted by anything. I was really focused and I was um, enjoying the learning. So I had opportunities to work with chefs who let me do a lot of research, uh, work on public events, presenting different uh, international cuisines. 
And that foundation was really great. I did a lot of baking. I did, I got to uh, spend a lot of time in our lab creating dishes. I won a few cooking contests with international foods that I had no knowledge of whatsoever until uh, I started preparing to compete, if you will. And, um, and then I just started cooking in every community event that I possibly could. And I was very fortunate to I have a passion for uh, thoroughbred horse racing. And uh, I, Bobby Flay is a noted uh, thoroughbred re- breeder and a noted uh, chef. And he puts on an event every year in Los Angeles called the Taste of the World. And so he selects um, a format and chooses restaurants to present their cuisine. And I volunteered there and uh, he extended an invitation to come to New York for my externship. And uh, (laughs) I got rid of everything, downsized my life, uh, packed up a suitcase and moved to New York to rent a room and uh, work in his restaurants. And it was an extra, it was about two years, extraordinary, extraordinary opportunities. Um, it was rough living in New York. So uh, with, cause I was a, um, I had the cushy life in California with sunshine all the time. I didn't know anything about snow or trying to move around in it. I didn't know anything about public transportation. I drove a car every day. Uh, so there was a lot of learning. And uh, But it, it, his restaurants had uh, a great deal of activity, a great deal of um, uh, huge menus. So there was so, so much to learn. And that was the extraordinary opportunity. And from there... Um, he, I worked at Bar American in New York and, uh, that he closed that down and I decided to accept an opportunity working in hunting lodges. And that was fantastic because you're blindfolded, taken to the location. You have one day to, uh, provision for the entire season and you have no idea what's coming and um, it was extraordinary, extraordinary. Different people every week. Uh, you never knew what the hunters were going to come home with, um, come back to the lodge with. Fortunately, I had studied uh, the, the Chaucer sauce and the hunting lodge um, traditions when I was in culinary school. That's what fascinated me with French cooking. So it was a good fit. And then uh, I moved on to fishing lodges in the Pacific Northwest and uh, eventually came to Nevada. Uh, I did spend some time on yachts in Florida and estates in Florida. That was extraordinary as well. And uh, I've been, I describe my career as kind of a feather in the wind. (laughs) Uh, because I, uh, I adopted a mentality that when one door closes, another one opens. Hopefully, you're not hanging out in a hallway for a long time, but uh, things always lined up for me. Um, I remember I was on a yacht. Uh, the charter ended. I came back from the British Virgin Islands and went to, I was sitting in the airport to fly back to Florida. I got the phone call. Are you available to uh, take this one month uh, opportunity with this family. And that turned into a year. And that was, that's kind of how things have evolved for me. I'm fortunate um, when I embarked upon my culinary career, I didn't have, uh, I wasn't married. I didn't have children. I didn't have a lot of ties. I was I didn't realize it at the time, but I was processing the grief of the loss of uh, my mom and uh, a few other key relationships that had occurred. And it was uh, a glorious way to celebrate life um, and to 
just be in a place of joy, irrespective of the uh, the subway rides. I think we talked about, <laughs> yeah. you know, getting off at <laughs> one o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the morning in New York, getting off your shift and uh, seeing the uh, bus boy get in a cab and <laughs> having the resources to wait an hour and a half to get on the subway. And, you know, uh, you take, you get contrast in life and uh, you take the good with the bad, but I think it all helps to help one define what really is, what really matters and what really um, is your passion and your joy. Now I, I have uh, I, this, this spot where I'm at in my career is really joyful. I have a great uh, balanced life. I'm part of a community. I have a, a nice home. I'm happy with what I do. I have uh, parties for 200. I have uh, parties for 10. Uh, I have quiet meals that I prepare for um, people who work really hard and um, provide a service to the community. And it's just a joyful, joyful life. I highly recommend it. <laughs> Well, that's everybody's uh, journey, right? To find that joyful, joyful life. I think so. And, uh, and I think it's different for everybody. I know um, when I was working uh, in a state, uh, it, it, it's just kind of interesting when you work uh, every day for a family um, that has a busy life. Um, that has a household of people that contribute to the high functioning of the day-to-day -day of their busy life and the layers of communication that really need to occur in order for you to put delicious, beautiful, flavorful food in front of them that comforts them and satisfies them and makes them happy, especially when sometimes... Uh, It's amusing because you'll, I know in my career, I've met families where uh, I'm introduced as uh, this is the paleo lover, this is the vegan, this person doesn't eat anything green, this one wants no spice, and this one wants as much spice as they can get. And you're working at putting all of that together <laughs> every day as they gather for their family dinner. Um, so, you know, the challenges are layered, the opportunities are layered and the, just the learning and the constant, um, uh, it's a level of excitement, I think, uh, for me trying to ascertain all of that. So how do you handle such a curveball when you really have a, a whole group of people, you know, everybody wants something else. Um, how, how do you usually go about those? Well, you know, it's kind of funny because when I was a kid, um, my mom would make dinners every week. And then there wouldn't be a whole lot of leftovers, but there would be something. And at the end of the week, we would have uh, what she would call dabs, a little dab of this and a little dab of that. And we would scramble for our favorites and that kind of thing. But it taught me to be conservative with food and to always have something, you know, handy. So you can, I've, I can, uh, vegetables, uh, you freeze things, you um, prepare menus that people can approve that have those different layers, but it just becomes a, a, an opportunity to discover the baseline palette. And a lot of people reveal that to you by talking about you know, what they grew up eating or what they, what, where they vacationed and the favorite foods that they had. Um, if you have a really wonderful um, house manager who has a close relationship with their family, um, where they really do talk about 
uh, things that make them happy, opportunities they've had, things that they really like. And they're able to communicate that to you. You can be ahead of the curve. You can keep things ready, mix them together. Um, sometimes it's a little bit easier because people eat at different times. Um based on their activities. So you're basically, maybe you're cooking uh, two or three meals, but they're not generally super large. And so it's easy to handle, yep. but you just get really versatile and multitasking is key. <laughs> yeah, that's... It sounds really complicated, but it gets really simple in a, in an odd way. Well, maybe experience makes it look simple. <laughs> you know, it's like when you work a world-class yeah. athlete, perform something that, you know, it looks so effortless, but it's only because of the hundreds and thousands of hours of training and experience that went into that one move. You know, I would, I would agree with that. And I think um, working for um, restaurants that are so highly regarded and so uh, popular – and having opportunities to work many different stations um, really has been a, a great contributor to uh, to my experience. It's been it, uh, sometimes it feels challenging because you don't know if you're up for it. But the minute you get into it, I think the greatest uh, aspect of that is you're shoved into your instincts more often than you realize, and that's where. Uh, you can, if everything slows down into slow motion and you're cooking without even thinking. So you really, really are being in your creative center and that's where it all comes together. Yeah, almost like flow state. I mean, you, yeah. you also, yeah. you, you've exposed yourself to so many different things. I mean, from like hunting lodges to yachts, to estates, to restaurants, there, there's, there's not a whole lot left that can uh, really take you by surprise. Uh, yeah, I guess that's true. I guess that's true. Although um, we do get our phone calls uh, when we think we're moving in a particular direction and, and we get a phone call that says, oh, uh, in two days, can you uh, throw together a luncheon for 50 people? And by the way, this person's allergic this person doesn't eat, this person isn't, and you're uh, working with a state budget, uh, which is different than working for um, an unlimited <laughs> budget. Uh, so uh, sometimes I think, oh, how are we going to do this? But that doesn't last long. Yeah, we pull it together. And uh, I'm fortunate. The yeah. people I work for are... Uh, appreciative and they're they're very vocal about uh, how much they love what they're eating and they share that information and we we don't have any doubts there's no second guessing it's just uh, a lot of a lot of love it's great I mean, having worked for so many different clients, it, it's probably not always been that way. And I, I think we, we all kind of have to learn how to become mind readers in this career path. Uh, yeah, it helps to be psychic, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, I'm not, but even then, I'm not sure. Um, uh, I think what you have to get used to is uh, you do your best to uh, to gather as much information as you possibly can but you also have to and you do the best job that you can and you trust that you have the experience for it but you ha you can't be attached to the end result because somebody may be having a bad day or they may just be completely unhappy with things that have nothing to do with you or that you would have no knowledge of whatsoever and you can't take that on. You can't have that be a part of uh, your day. Uh, you, you, you just kind of let go. And that's when I think uh, you, you can stay in a state of flow as much as possible. Um, people. I, I must. Oh, go ahead. 
Go ahead. Well, I'm going to say people, um, I think most people want to sit down and first of all, savor what they're going to eat with their eyes and, uh, and anticipate and enjoy their food. Uh, and then other times they want to sit down and just be comforted or they don't want to think at all. They just want to enjoy it and have it nourish them and comfort them. But you can't ever know what space they're in. So you just do the best you can. Yeah. Yeah, I, w I was about to say that for me, that part, particular part was a bit challenging at first because, you know, you it's it's hard to understand as you said and you you can't always do that in which mind space there are and you know so sometimes we do take it personal maybe when the the feedback about the food is a certain way or maybe the the dish comes back and and then i'm always concerned because like hey what, what did i do wrong but oftentimes it's it's not about us it's just it could it could be a uh, innumerable amount of things That, that, that's definitely a lesson I had to learn over the years, to not take, take it all personal. Yes, and I think for me, um, so I, I had such wonderful experience uh, in Bobby's restaurants because, I mean, here is an unquestionably uh, fantastic chef who uh, is noted. I mean, my goodness, he taught, President Obama, how to grill at the White House. So he's a confident guy and he knows what he's doing and his restaurants are uh, set up so that everyone working there knows what they're doing. So when you grill meat and it comes off the grill, 98% of the time, uh, you, you, you're confident in what you're putting on that plate. And I was, yeah. I was at the restaurant one day, and a lady sent her uh, meat back three times. Three times. And none of us, I mean, we all agreed that we just, we didn't know her perception of what she was asking for. Because we were delivering our perception, and we even modified our perception to try to accommodate her. And there just wasn't... There wasn't a, a, a place for it to connect, you know, for us to really understand uh, what she was looking for. So when those kinds of things happen, and they don't happen very often, but they, when they can happen in a place that's so consistent and so well regarded, uh, it can happen anywhere. So you do have to let go. Yeah. And I think that that's a great point. I mean, you you kind of have to have that confidence in in your ability to deliver, and then then it's a different different thing. But nevertheless, I I, I think working maybe especially for one family, and the, the smaller I guess the the amount of people we're working for, the 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 more so it can get to us. Um, yeah, and. Because I would I would agree, and I think um, it's important when you're interviewing with a family to have an opportunity to really talk to the family. A lot of times, when you're interviewing, you're only uh, dealing with the hiring managers in their system, and that can be uh, a house manager. It could it could be anybody in their system, but. Um, It's not our kind of lifestyle, our kind of, uh, yeah, you know, as a private chef, our kind of work is not off the shelf at all. You're really trying to get to know the person in an interview or the family in an interview, but you're also the whole initial period of time that you're working with them. And if you're lucky, it continues. Um, you're learning their palates you're, and then their guests. You're learning uh, as what you can about them. Um, I, I was really fortunate with most of the people that I worked with who they, the happier they were about what they were eating, the more excited they were about sharing more information because they wanted you to try other things. Oh, can you replicate this? Can you replicate that? 
can you replicate this experience I had in Thailand? And um, maybe you can't with the external, but you certainly can with or try to with the internal. And um, that has to do with the food. Yeah. How do you feel about replicating things? Sometimes when I read um, job postings and it's like, yeah, ability to replicate anything. And that, that to me is <laughs> sometimes like, okay, here we go. <laughs> Because, uh, that, that, I mean, that, that can be really interesting to walk into that. <laughs> you know, um, uh, on the fun side, uh, in my commercial banking career, uh, I financed an operation in Palo Alto, California, and it was a bakery, and they made extraordinary desserts. And they had a cake that they called the weekend cake. And the reason they called it that is because during the week it was, uh, it, it was a particular price, but there was a huge uh, college population there. And on Friday, they would mark the cake down, the price of the cake down to a third of the cost so that they could sell anything that was left over. And so a lot of people who couldn't otherwise afford <laughs> to buy the cake, uh, could eat it. And so I was in Nebraska in this, uh, uh, at a location where there were people I didn't know. And I was introduced to a lovely couple who had been one of the students uh, that bought the weekend cake in Palo Alto. And they, they used to talk about it and they asked me to replicate it. And fortunately, because I had tasted it several times, I was able to. But the journey of doing my best to replicate it um, was so much fun. And, uh, <laughs> you know, trying to remember the texture and trying to remember the flavors. It was a chocolate cake that had mocha icing, but it had uh, a different flavor icing on the outside. And it was a three-layer cake and it had all kinds of chocolate shavings and just trying to get it to all match. And I was thrilled when I presented them with a the cake and they ate it and said that I nailed it. It was fun. So um, I think that experience helped me to uh, understand that I can do that, but do I want to do it every day or do I want to do it all the time? Um, I think not, um, because it really does involve <laughs> quite a bit. It's not just slapping something together or throwing it together. Um, it's really trying to understand uh, what registers with someone. And um, I, I think a lot of job uh, descriptions are far, they're overgeneralized and far and sweeping because oftentimes the people Uh, doing the hiring, don't know what's out there, don't want to eliminate anything, don't want to disappoint uh, their principles, and they're just casting a wide net. But I think, honestly, if they can be as specific as possible about what their family really likes and um, what, it, what the real expectations are and have them be somewhat reasonable so that They, they're showing that they care about who their chef is. We want you to have a balanced life. We don't want you to be here working every day. We want you to enjoy your life because we know that that contributes to how you do your job. I, I think you'll find people matching up more succinctly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think there's, I mean, there's, uh, I guess, some of the agents or agencies, they use um, templates, you know, where, okay, check the box, okay, driver's license, all, and then you, you, you just <laughs> write that whole thing out. And um, it, it sounds very generic, but as a candidate, we don't really, we, we can't really tell you know, if, if we're the best fit or not. And, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's both ways, you know, they, it, it doesn't, it doesn't translate if there is no personality in the, in the job description. 
I I agree. I agree. And the uh, the, the other thing that I think um, uh, hiring people do is they'll gr- grab a list of foods. Like when you go to do a cooking trial, um, don't like any of these things, allergic to these things. Uh, but they don't talk about what their preferences are, you know. Uh, and I, I've never seen a, a list where someone says, uh, you know, prefers any particular textures or any particular uh, flavors, or uh, or they'll say um, they like Japanese food. Well, that's. <laughs> That's a huge palette just right there. You know, there's it, it, it's not succinct enough or it's not um, baseline enough, I guess. So yeah, e- um, even the- if they say favorite restaurants, that that sometimes isn't necessarily a, a good expression of what they actually want to eat. No, I mean, uh, some restaurants, yeah, well, will cook anything or cook everything or have everything available or especially with seasonal menu change changes when did they eat there did they eat there in the fall did they eat there in the spring um you just don't know so uh and i've had people say well what's your favorite thing to cook well you know (laughs) where am i and what what season am am i in (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> my favorite changes. I mean, I have periods of time in my life where my f- absolute favorite thing to put together is ramen, and it's never the same. <laughs> it's different every day. Um, or, uh, you know, uh, tacos. Uh, you can have, uh, there's so many uh, cultures that have a version of a taco and so many flavor profiles. I won a cooking contest. Uh, a Korean cooking contest making a quesadilla. And uh, that was a super fun experience, but it was also a surprise to the very traditional chefs who I competed with because, and I remember (laughs) uh, after the contest was over because I won some money and I also won a car. uh, So there was, there was, People were seriously competing, and this guy came back into the kitchen and said, "A quesadilla." <laughs> so, you know, uh, you just never know. You just never know what what is. So, what was the expectation of the jury? Like, since you delivered uh, a quesadilla, was it supposed to be um, like actually Korean? Uh, well, what happened is we arrived and they gave us two in Korean ingredients to work with. One was kimchi and one was uh, a, 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 a bean paste, uh, a spicy bean paste flavoring. And we were supposed to create something with that. Well, I made... Um, flour tortillas, I made them, um, and I made a, a, a salsa from the kimchi with jalapeno, and I cooked it with butter, and it was very rich. But I brined my chicken thighs in some pickle juice that was there and grilled a lot of uh, jalapenos, and I had um, uh, shizu leaves and things like that that I used, but it was all the flavors. And then I made a um, an albondiga soup that was with the the flavoring, so it tasted like a Korean flavoring. And then I presented everything in the uh, little dishes all around it. So it was my presentation was Korean. But I yeah. I, w- I was told that one of the things that tipped the judge, who did not speak any English, he was Korean, but one of the things that tipped him over the edge was that. Uh, I applied seven dots of the hot sauce that I made on the plate, and apparently seven was the lucky number for uh, 
for uh, is the Korean lucky number. So he thought that it was a lucky plate, and um, but he did enjoy the, <laughs> the taste. So you never know what it's, what it's going to be about, but. Um, you know, I think uh, our food truck industry has helped us to understand that you can take a cuisine and a preferred food delivery system, a burrito, a taco, a salad, a soup, and you can ma- marry the two and satisfy a great number of people. Yeah. I mean, that's that's really been the lucky blade in that case. <laughs> yeah, it was what, for what, me. What, what, it was a game kind of, changer. What kind of what kind of car did you win? It was a Chevrolet Astro van, and uh, it was it could was easily adapted for catering. So that was I really appreciated that at that time in my life. <laughs> <laughs> that that's great. <laughs> I'm sure that the other chefs been pretty upset. How did this happen? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, well, I think anytime you, um, I'm enjoying this aspect of my life where all of my cooking is done in a cooperative environment. And, uh, you know, I think the industry uh, as a whole, because of all the cooking shows um, and all of the public competitions, uh, is a competitive industry. But um, when we get together, um, I, I was able to work a, a few of the Los Angeles food shows. And what I saw was uh, a lot of people from a lot of places coming together, sharing kitchen space and really being cooperative in that process and delivering their food so that a wide audience could enjoy it. And uh, that, I think, is more important. It, it, it's better when it's not a zero sum game, only one person wins uh, or someone wins a consolation. Everybody needs to win. Yeah. So for someone coming into this industry at this stage, what, what would you give them on their way? So much experience that you have and you, you know, you already kind of um, had that career transition. Um, what would you give somebody as best advice to get started as a private chef? Uh, well, I think it helps if you're in a um, space in your life where you don't have a lot of attachments, where you're free to enjoy a number of things. Because I don't know any private chefs who have gone, who have been hired for jobs where they've stayed <laughs> at all of them. Some of them work out for a week. Some of them work out for a month. Um, and you can't attach, you know, if your livelihood, if your family's livelihood is dependent upon you making that connection in the system that we have now, where you just have a very brief time to try to make that connection, I, I, I think that's tough. I think that's really tough. And you might end up settling for something that isn't fully satisfying because you're trying to take care of people in your own household. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's more ideal if you have the freedom to explore and to give yourself permission to trust what works for you and what doesn't work for you. Then you'll find your soft landing. Then you'll find your happy place with people that you, you enjoy. Because any family that you work with is not a stagnant um, organism. It's or not a, or a, a stagnant system. You have, uh, if you have children, they grow and they're, they're, as they grow, their taste grows. Uh, People move, people uh, expand their family, people have invite others to come and live in their family. And they're not all necessarily the healthiest of families. Uh, they may be uh, successful and have a uh, resource of people to help them negotiate their lives and live their lives, but they themselves may not be 
uh, they may be experiencing difficulties or changes or evolutions that uh, that are troublesome, and you you don't know that until you spend time with them, and that can change from the minute you get there. So. Um, I always thought that a private chef <laughs> role was like, you know, something that you would that you would find with uh, the royal family or something where you come on board and you're there for 10 years and, uh, you know, or 15 or 20. But it, I have not met anyone who is a private chef who um, hasn't had opportunity to uh, move around. And I mean, I've had jobs change because someone passed away and the family structure changed and they didn't, uh, you know, they chose to move into different locations. So they didn't need a private chef. And you, you've got to be prepared to uh, accept and roll with uh, whatever comes along. So I would yeah. say... Uh, you know, to answer your question more succinctly, be uh, flexible, be open and try and see it as an as an adventure, not just to work with people that you might admire and respect, but also to learn about yourself and to trust yourself. That's what the journey's about. Yeah, I think. Uh one of the longest positions that I've seen somebody hold was 17 years with their same family. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's great. And I don't then, know any uh, of those actually, people. <laughs> actually then the chef retired. Uh, so the ah. I think the family, the family would have kept them, but the chef was ready to retire. Yeah. Well, that would definitely be, um, be something I think that a lot of people would find ideal. Uh, I didn't know that uh, moving around and experiencing all the things that I have uh, would be my idea of ideal, but it's turned out to be. Yeah, well, it um, it, it it helps keeps things interesting and fresh and uh, I think there is a benefit to both maybe like there is a, I think families and some chefs appreciate it when everything is well oiled and you know you kind of know what you're getting into literally on an annual basis and but there is also something that chefs as well as family appreciate if there is you know there is a new flavors on the plate there's different ideas and different experiences like I'm, I'm sure having someone like you coming fresh from the hunting lodge is, uh, is very different than if you have the same chef there for five years who, you know, might have his ways and maybe is uh, missing a little bit of inspiration at that point. Yeah. You know, uh, I've, uh, worked for people who, ha um, they're going through a change in their health and they have dietary restrictions so the initial job is based on your ability to uh, create and cook flavorful food within those restrictions. And what's been exciting for me in those particular cases is then expanding the food to include things that they've never tried before that still meet the dietary restrictions, but expose them to other flavors. Then I think that makes them feel less confined by their health uh, changes and their dietary restrictions. But, you know, I think that's the other thing for people now coming into uh, the role um, irrespective of where they are in their lives, whether they're beginning their career, whether they're making a shift from restaurant to private chef, uh, is that um, most people are focused on health. Uh, people, I think, have discovered that the world is a great place and they want to live as long as possible and uh, they want to be as mobile as possible. And so um, just... And health means different things to different people. Some, for some people, it means no salt. If it, for some people, it means no carbohydrates. <laughs> you know, it's just 
what it means. But if you're if you're able to explore something yourself and find um, some pleasure in that, you have something to offer others who are looking for it as well. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's definitely something that has served me well to also, because I'm, I'm a bit of a health nut at this stage, and, and I just pursued my natural inclination towards that. And uh, it really translated well, because the more and more clients were interested in that, and I think that's that's a pattern we're seeing more and more of the job postings ask for that to kind of a, the understanding of whatever healthy means. And as you said, you know, that could mean so many different things. It could be plant-based or it could be keto or, you know. Yeah. Or it could be something totally new to the people who are asking for it. And they may not even fully know what that means. You know, they just know that that's what's been recommended or suggested to them. And there are, I mean, personally, um, I've I've made some conscious decisions as well about what I eat and and my overall health, and I find uh, that to just stick with something specific doesn't work for me. I kind of have a hybrid, and um, but the more that I keep my overall life, uh, you know. I keep my exercise regular. I keep my uh, work-life balance uh, as stable as I possibly can. Um, the less tug and pull I have on my uh, on cravings and on uh, on things I want to eat, and the more I have on uh, it, uh, the more I stay in a place of curiosity to explore new things. Yeah, and so I never get I, bored. I was I always find that sleep is an is a good fix to keep cravings in check. Sleep and hydration. Yeah. Yeah. All the all the stuff <laughs> that you that you've heard about for decades and uh you know it's all true. <laughs> it's all it's all true. <laughs> we just we just have to learn it for ourselves. Yeah, you know, it's just a, it, it, it's a wonderful career to participate in. It's a wonderful life. And, uh, you know, people say to me, uh, it's funny because I was writing uh, with a group of people that I didn't really know that well to the airport uh, just a few days ago. And we were talking and, uh, and I started talking, they were asking me what I was going to be cooking next. And I started talking about it. And by the time I got to the airport, everyone was really unhappy with me because they weren't near a place where they were going to be eating, but they were all very hungry. So um, <laughs> it's uh, uh, people who know me and who I spend time with have gotten used to it. They're going to be hungry because I'm going to talk about food. <laughs> <laughs> but I well, usually have probably, something to share. Yeah, was well, so they they probably also got into the um the, they had the chance to actually taste it too. Oh yes. Not yeah. just not just hear about it. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It's a lot of fun when um you know when you make something simple like a chocolate cake, but you make uh, you make it simply and you make it a chocolate cake um, that they eat it and they there's no talking it's just very quiet all you hear is the fork sliding on the plate and it's not until everyone's done and they're smiling and they say that is the best chocolate cake I've ever had and <laughs> it, it may not be the best chocolate cake in the world or the best chocolate cake out there but it's but it's something that's um, registered for them and that they will think about now it's a new food memory and now it's a new standard and they'll be looking to connect with that and I think that's what happens to all of us and we have no way of knowing unless we really get people talking about some of their food experiences what um, a particular dish means to them yeah. because it's their experience do you do you um do you know the Disney movie Ratatouille? <laughs> yes. 
you know, that that always comes to my mind. It's like, you know, where where the crumpy food tester turns like all childlike again when the food recalls the memory. Yes, when you connect with it. And in my personal experience, the grumpy person who sits down to a meal, <clears throat> pardon me, and that meal does not connect with that memory, <laughs> you might see a little deeper level of grumpiness <laughs> from that person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that might be one of the pitfalls in uh, having to replicate something that's supposed to trigger childhood memories. <laughs> yeah, without some information, replicating is um, uh, is shooting straight, you know, trying to shoot straight in the dark. It's just uh, a wing and a prayer. Yeah, I used to have uh, one particular instance where it usually I got like, I felt like I got 30% of the recipe maybe in terms of just like, Oh, it's 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 like this and this and, this. and then the 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 two third were missing, and then when you serve it, it's like ah no that that's not it. <laughs> why don't you give me the? Why don't you give me the help whole me. thing? Yeah, yeah, help, you, me, help me. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that you say recipe too, because that's the other part. Is that when you're just cooking, you're not. A lot of times you're not using a recipe. You're matching something to your palate. And one of my early influences um, when I started out is I was exposed to a gentleman. Um, I think he was one of the pioneers in uh, food television in the, in, uh, with the BBC. Um, and he was British, and his name was uh, Keith Floyd. And he never used a recipe. He would only provide ingredient lists. And he said uh, he would travel. His cooking show was traveling. And he would go to villages and far out places and discover new ingredients. And then he would match them. He would learn their, a bit about their culture and how that was matched together. And then he would adapt those things to other things that he uh, knew about and, and enjoyed. But uh, he never provided a recipe. And people ask me all the time, um, oh, can I have the recipe for that? Well, I can give you the recipe, but I don't know if it's going to come out the same because I'll usually when I'm cooking, I'll adapt it. So, And, and that's uh, unless it's a, it's a system like in a restaurant where things are really dialed in, actually mm -hmm. recipes don't translate. And that's, mm. I mean, that's uh, any home chef kind of knows that. But even if if I ask some of my friends who are in the restaurant industry for, for recipes, I already know it's not going to turn out the way they do it. Because if, <laughs> you know, it has to do with what we adjust. There's so many movements in there. And I think baking is a good example. Baking is such a science where it's more dialed in than in other recipes. But even in, in baking, those nuances make the difference, and in cooking, even more so. I agree. And, uh, you know, we, uh, when I worked at Bar American, uh, we had a, sun, a weekend brunch, and there was a coffee cake that was on the menu. And uh, Bobby presented a bread basket uh, as part of the the regular routine and that coffee cake was in there and people would beg for more <laughs> of that coffee cake. It was extraordinary. Um, and then when they started asking for the recipe, it got comical because it literally takes three days to make because you make the base and then you make the center and then you do the top and bake it. And when they saw how many ingredients went into it and what the process was, they'd say, oh, forget it. I'll just go up to the restaurant for it. But they were always forlorn because they couldn't buy it, just, you know, buy it to yeah. go or take it. To, it was part of it was, you know, part of the basket. You had to buy the brunch to get the to get the, the basket. So um, and the brunch was extraordinary as well. And there are many options. But um but people don't realize that when you have something that appeals 
to such a wide audience, uh, there's a lot that's gone into it. Well, Cindy, time flies. We're, we're already far in. Thank you so much for your time. Um, yeah, where can people connect with you? Well, um, that's kind of interesting. I've just started a new Instagram called uh, Any Great Board. I'm, uh, because I have such a great balanced life right now, work balance, and my creative juices are flowing again, and I'm making um, food preparation boards and uh, butter boards and uh, charcuterie boards that are available to purchase as well. So uh, there's lots of ideas and that kind of thing. So Any Great Board on Instagram And then I have my personal, I just have a personal Facebook page, uh, Cindy Trejo. Uh, so hopefully um, uh, if anyone tunes in, they see something that uh, gets them excited about cooking their own thing. <laughs> And definitely the way you speak about food, it, it always translates. Thank you so much. It's been a delight to spend time with you. And lovely to meet you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us at the Private Chef Podcast. If you know any highly skilled chefs that want to take their life to the next level, make sure to share this podcast with them. And if you enjoyed this episode, click subscribe and check out our upcoming episodes. Thank you for listening.